Hello, Global Theater. My name is Jerry Fialka. Today is June 25, 2021. We want to thank Clinton Ignatoff. Thank you so much, Clinton, for all your help, and we'll see you soon. John David Ebert. Is that the correct way to pronounce your last name, John? That is. Thank you so much for being with us today. The first question, John, is what's the best thing for a human being? The best thing is uh, to live a, a life in uh, in regards to spirituality. I think spirituality is the absolute fundamental core. Wow. Is spirituality more innate in humans or more invented? No, I think it's innate. I, I think it comes right out of the human psyche. Uh, and it, it is absolutely fundamental because uh, we have to recall that all the great high civilizations came out of religions. So you can't have a civilization without an inceptual religion. The, the atheist phases that come at the tail end of civilizations are just the dying phases of civilizations running out of gas, basically, and running on fumes. Um, but religion is, is the first thing that this is the thing that atheists don't understand how, how fundamental religion is. Really beautiful. Thank you. And, uh, and thanks for being so dang articulate. I really appreciate all your videos and I've learned a lot. So what's thank your favorite? Yeah, thank, thank you. What's your favorite form of information, how it comes into you? Well, reading books, absolutely. Reading actual books, not... Uh, I have to read a lot of electronic texts because they're so damn easy to grab now. Yeah. So I'm forced to read a, a lot of them that way, plus they're cheaper. Uh, but I do definitely prefer the printed text because um, it, it, it involves not just the sense of sight, but the tac tactility as well. And yeah. I can make on the page so that I'm more likely to remember what I read because uh, I'll have a visual image in my head that's been reinforced by my fingers feeling the pages. Uh, so I definitely prefer print, printed books. Yeah, I think we're alike. I bet you you also like the smell of a used bookstore. <laughs> Absolutely. We are totally in sync. You just walk right in there and you know that smell immediately. And there's nothing, yeah. There is no smell like it. It's, yeah, it's great. John, did you pick up reading because your parents were reading and that was an example or on your own or some other way? How did you? No, my parents weren't, weren't readers. Well, my dad was, but a lot of junky pop culture stuff. And my mom did read bestsellers, um, but not really when I was a small kid. She didn't turn to reading till much later on in her life. Danielle Steele novels, you know, romance yeah. novels, uh, stuff, stuff like that. But um no, it was just something that I fell into on my own as a result, ironically enough, of watching movies, uh, staying up late with my dad, because my mother worked the night shift at Motorola. So my dad uh, would allow me to stay up till like 11, 12 o'clock at night, and we would watch all these uh, horror movies, black and white horror movies from the 1930s, like The Mummy and Frankenstein and Dracula. We would watch those. And then when he would take me to 7-Eleven, there were magazines connected with those movies, Famous Monsters of Filmland in particular, and I begged him to buy that thing for me, and he bought it, and then that's where my reading career started. So it, it was connected with movies, actually. Dude, we are so alike. I mean, I I thrive on going through five to ten magazines and newspapers a day and ripping out articles. <laughs> you know, it's that turning the page. Now, Back to information, John, why do you think humans collect or gather information? In order to make life possible, because you can't you can't build a civilization without information and without everybody knowing what their task is, what, what Heidegger calls Dasein, which is a pre-philosophical understanding that every person has, and he, and he calls it pre-philosophical because it's naive. Uh, people are naive but knowledgeable nonetheless about what it is that they're supposed to do, and they just do it. But they've got, the information is essential to run the society. You can't run a society without information. Wow, that was good. Now, I, you probably answered that, but is this desire or need or want to collect information more innate in humans or more invented? Again, innate, I think. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I, I lean in the empiricist rationalist debate and rationalism does not mean reason in that tradition. Uh, it, it means that you're born with innate ideas. 
And I, I tend to side with, you know, it comes from Plato. I, I tend to side with that tradition that we are born yeah. with some, we, we know what we're doing here. It's not all learned. It's, we know what to do. Yeah. Do thoughts create emotions? Um, yes, but emotions also create thoughts. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So it's, again, it's, it's a cybernetic interplay, a, a steering process that involves the feeling of emotions, which can generate new thoughts. Let's say you have a bad emotion about someone. Uh, you're pissed off at your girlfriend because she cheated on you. So now you start a train of thinking uh, that comes out of those thoughts. But at the same time, certain uh, beautiful thoughts that you might have while writing will create beautiful emotions, especially if you're writing something as I've had the pleasurable experience of. Um, it's almost like mental orgasms. I, I mean, I've had points where I knew what I was writing was so good and it just gave me pure pleasure. And so the, the two are interconnected, actually. Yeah. Why did humans invent language? So that they could uh, communicate with each other without having to slap each other around. So it, it sort of moves from just being physical and rough with each other to being more verbal so that you could articulate. And humans are unique amongst animals in this respect that if something is hurting inside me somewhere, I can tell you where the pain's coming from. Oh, my rib hurts. I think I might have broken it. An animal can't do that. All an animal can do is, is just sort of suffer and maybe limp. But we have language, so it can actually externalize what's going on within us so that we can better relate to each other and understand each other. Really well done. But I think that I will ask you this question because we don't know what language animals talk in. So wasn't part of your answer, you were anthropomorphizing our thinking sure. or language onto animals in there that last a, Animals do have, yeah, they, they do have their own language and they can understand each other. But at the same time, they really don't have this ability though to externalize if something is hurting inside them, they can't tell you where it hurts. They, they, they can't, they just can't do that. Um, so I remember when my, I had a cat once who broke its toe, some dogs chased him up a tree and he, and he fell and broke his toe. And the only way he could communicate his pain was if you touch that toe, then he hissed. So that was his language telling you, ouch. But otherwise, he did not have the ability to say, you know, my toe is fucking hurting. Can, can we do something about this? <laughs> <laughs> John, uh, Lily Tomlin said we invented language, or her and her partner, Jane Wagner, said we invented language to complain. What's <laughs> That's not too bad, actually. Uh, that's that's pretty good. And, and you know, I I love this cliche that I believe is true that if you complain and you gossip, you live longer because you're getting it out of your system. Now, yes, yes, absolutely. No, go ahead with your yeah. The question is, what's the difference? Because you're involved in this world of critical thinking. What's the difference between complaining and critical critical thinking? Hold on on that. I want to go back to what you just said about living longer by getting it off your chest. Because I heard, I was listening one morning to a radio show where just randomly, I don't remember what it was, where they were talking about how keeping secrets actually harms your immune system. It, it actually, uh, so maybe people who keep secrets live shorter lives. Um, and so you need, you always need at least one person in your life that you can unburden your deepest secrets to because it's easier on your immune system because keeping things inside act actually exerts stress on you. So that echoes what you just said. I, I thought that was really interesting when I heard that a few months ago, actually. Um, so the other question now was about critical thinking versus uh, what, remind me? Uh, complaining, yeah. What's the difference between complaining and critical thinking? Interesting, because they are related. Uh, critical thinking involves always finding fault you know, uh, this this movie isn't as good as this book. You know, there is a certain complaint aspect that's always involved in critical thinking. Uh, yeah, so they're they're in a really. So far, I think you're you're the funniest interviewer I've ever had. You're, you're I really appreciate your wit, Jerry. Th uh, thank you very much. Well, they, that's perfect because you 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 force fed me to tell you Hitchcock and McLuhan's favorite joke: two goats are eating film 
coming out of a film can right over here in Culver City at the MGM lot. And one goat turns to the other and said, the book was better. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Yeah, there is a complaining aspect to criticism. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. They're, they're really so um, do you more pursue meaning or more pursue happiness? Well, I probably meaning. Um, I've had a lot of trouble with unhappiness in my life, but uh, meaning has gone much better. I would say the meaning versus happiness track Meaning has gone much better. So uh, I just have a natural gift for figuring things out. And uh, so I'm, I'm blessed with that. And, you know, other people are blessed with athleticism. I'm not. Other people, like my brother, can hack into any computer system, but, but he doesn't know a damn thing about anything. You know, it, it just depends. It, it, <laughs> everybody has a different talent. Mine is figuring out meaning. Uh, but I wish that know, knowing things about the world made me happier. Uh, but sometimes it, it really turns into the opposite, where the more I, I, I know about the world, sort of the more unhappy I get about it, because so many things that are true are hurtful to deal with and, and difficult. So, yeah, really, well, that's, that's interesting. Jerry, I've, I've never been asked questions kind of, kind of like this. I'm, oh, this well, always. I appreciate it. I could tell you were perfect for this. Because, you know, I, I go off script sometimes, and, and this is a perfect time because I've been contemplating this, that, you know, why why do humans create our, well, we're going to get into that. Let's, let's well, hold off on that one. I'm sorry. Um, does the brain more detect consciousness or create consciousness? Well, I think the brain is consciousness made material, and I, and I don't think that Consciousness, to, um, I don't think that it's an epiphenomenon of the brain. I think that the brain is much more like, a, I'm sorry to say in a cliched way, much more like a receiver, like a television set. It's receiving consciousness from elsewhere and it's tuning it in. And I think that's what the brain is. It's, it's a tuning device. Uh, I don't think consciousness emerges from it. Consciousness is before it. Um, that's what I would say for that. Yeah. And what's faster, speed of light or speed of thought? Be the thought. Yeah. Because <laughs> you can get ideas that are like, bam, I just got a great idea for a book. Dude, you got to hear this. <laughs> <laughs> um, there's no right or wrong answers to any of these questions, John, but that one you got right. Thank you. <laughs> um, Audre Lord said, you can't dismantle the master's house using the master's tools. Yvonne Rayner responded, and said, you can if you expose the tools. What new tool do you suggest? That's a strange question. So so what is this person talking about as far as the master? Yeah, uh, well, for, first of all, it's a it's sort of a, a, a wonky question because I don't necessarily need you to apply the question to the opening quotes. Most people say, you mean which new tool do I... Uh, suggest to dismantle the master's house. You know, Audre Lorde was a, a, I think, a feminist black poet who was saying, we can't dismantle the master's house, you know, the government authority, whoever, using yeah. their tools. It's sort of like Jer George Lakoff did this too. And when Occupy happened, he said, you can't just use their language. You got to use their language and invent a new language. And that's why, in my opinion, Occupy succeeded in some ways because they invented sort of live streaming news right away. You know, they had their and they did, you know, other sort of things. But they also used the typical PR devices. They were in. They were in the Wall Street Journal immediately. They swooped them right up. So it's just like there's no new tools necessarily. But, you know, Yvonne Rayner responded and says, if you expose the tools, you can dismantle the house. So it's just basically what new tool do you suggest? Gotcha. This is what Arnold Toynbee calls in his book, A Study of History, the idolization of an ephemeral technology. And he says, David confronting Goliath is a classic example of this because Goliath is uh, dressed in full armor. He's got his spear. Uh, he's been victorious in battle after battle. And here shows up this kid with a very simple technology 
new with respect to Goliath, but a very old one, actually, the slingshot. Um, but Goliath has never seen this thing be before, and he's totally arrogant. And here comes the new technology. David just slings it, and you know that's it. That's the end of the game. Uh, so very often cultures get very arrogant, and uh, especially the establishment, we might say, is very often fighting today's battles with yesterday's strategies and solutions. And so that's why they often get undermined by groups that are disaffected and come up with their own new means, their own new technical means of communication, like Twitter, for example, via the Iranian revolution or, or whatever that undermines the establishment because the establishment is always arrogant and resting on its laurels and thinking about its past victories. Meanwhile, civilization has moved on. Yeah. Really well put, because it's like the, the prank the guy did on the NRA guy yesterday or the day before. Like, so you know about that? He, the, the, oh. NRA, well, the NRA guy did a, 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 a commencement speech to a, a 3,000 seated empty auditorium because they told him it was practice. And, and in essence, that was the 3,000 seat for representing. All, all the kids who were killed by guns this year, you know. So then they could use it as a news item to bust the NRA guy. So, you know, I mean, I appreciate all. It's like the Yes Men or Abby Hoffman or any any of the political prankster guys, Paul Krasner, they all, you know, how effective are they in the long run? So, no, you answered it, and um, we'll we'll get to that topic a little more. What do you worry about when you go to bed at night? Oh, I worry about <laughs> your questions are so great. I, this is the question <laughs> ever. I get used to hearing the same questions over and over again. <laughs> wow. Okay. I'm gonna go to bed. I guess I worry about whether I'll have the energy tomorrow to do get my work done. You know, <laughs> I have That's a, tendency, a good one. Yeah, I have a tendency to get slothful. You know. <laughs> And uh, I always worry about it. Okay, I got to get this done, that done, and the other thing done. I just hope I have the energy to do it. So yeah, yeah. I I'm through, through the same thing myself, and I think we have to be able to get in touch with our slothful self and be able to relax sometimes, and and you know, cash in on slack, but at the same time stay driven. It's that's a, but I. I you do need days off, don't you? I mean, yeah. <laughs> you need to take naps, but I like, um, you go, you know, you love my questions. Well, basically, I've just collected questions from all the great interviews. And that, that last one was Earl Morris asking Rumsfeld, what do you worry about when you go to bed at night? <laughs> oh, this is Earl Morris, the documentary? Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I love that guy's documentaries. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. And Rumsfeld is like... Yeah, when you watch 90 minutes of Rumsfeld talking, you go, this guy is pure McLuhan, man. He's walking all over. Just, just like McNam McNamara did the same thing. They walk all over Errol. But yeah, Errol does a good job, so it's not to condemn. So, yeah, um, yeah so here's, here's where we get more into this thing that you brought up was amazing. You said the brain is a receiver. It's a, a tuning device. Yeah. So McLuhan learned from Ezra Pound that art artists are the antenna of the race. They're broadcasting the hidden psychic effects of our inventions so that we can learn to cope with what we don't like about the invention. So McLuhan's, one of his main percepts is, well, we can look to the artists, the poets, the every, you know, the creators to expose and reveal these hidden psychic effects, but why do we still ignore the hidden psychic effects? That's an excellent uh, question because you're right about this, McLuhan talking about artists as the distant early warning system of a society. And you can see this over and over and over again. Let's say Mark Rothko, for instance, with all of his luminous squares. Uh, now we're surrounded by nothing but luminous squares. I interesting how he was ahead of the game there. Same thing with like, William Gibson with his novel Neuromancer and his, uh, his sort of invention of cyberspace. Now, now we've got the internet. Well, William Gibson predicted the, the whole thing. So yeah, I think the artist is always a jump ahead. The, the good artist, the, the one who's worth his salt. 
uh, it, it, or her is always a jump ahead. And um, that's great because we, we have these artists as sort of the antennae of the species that can clue us into coming transformations in our culture because every time new media and new technology come along, they change the culture in unpredictable ways. It's very unpredictable. We, we don't know when we invent a new medium what's going to happen. We didn't know but when the military invented ARPANET, they didn't know it was going to melt away analog technology completely, Photo photography, and, you know, the, the books, and the, they, they had no idea. So you can't predict that, but the artists can. Uh, through allegorical and science fictional and mythological scenarios, they, they can just sort of pick up on it. And who knows how it works, but, but they, they do it. But why do we ignore? Why do humans ignore the hidden psychic effects, even though we can turn to the artist to reveal them? Because we can't, because they're subliminal. We can't pick up on them. They're subliminal. Uh, it's like uh, if you int introduce the television, you don't know that it's going to eliminate singing in, in pubs. People are going to stop singing in pubs because now they just look up at the television. And then in the next generation, now they don't look at the television. They sit there and look at their phones. So they're even more isolated. Um, and you can't predict that at the invention of each of these technologies because the change in the environmental circumstances are totally subliminal. You're just not aware of it unless you have either a good philosopher like McLuhan or uh, a great artist like Gibson to bring uh, these changed environments to our awareness. Yeah, it's like uh, Martha Graham said, great artists aren't ahead of their times. They are their times. Yeah. So when jo Joyce, uh, he basically, James Joyce listened to shortwave radio in Paris when Duchamp's there in the 20s and wrote it all down. And he he predicted, yeah, I don't like that word, but he did, like you said, presage or whatever. No. People watching TVs in pubs. It's in Finnegan's Wake. There's a guy watching a TV in a pub <laughs> in 1939, and it's like TVs barely being invented. <laughs> yeah, it's just the concept had been invented pretty much, but but it wasn't yeah. the, the 1950s mass distribution of it. Yeah. Right. So do you think generally, and you know, I know that the either or questions are sort of stupid. I don't do too many of them, but it depends and all that, but you've handled them well. You haven't attacked me once for saying either or. I love that. A lot of people go, well, ah, it's not. but it is, it's more than that. It, these are just stimuli to, to talk about things. Um, do you think your observations of humans, are they more feeling beings or more thinking beings in general? Feeling. Yeah. Yeah, I think that uh, we're uh, an extremely emotional species, and it's as though the neocortex, and that comes from our mammalian brains, of course, which comes from the fact that unlike reptiles, reptiles just lay their eggs and they and they ditch them, uh, whereas mammals can't do that. They have the mother-child bond is instant and immediate, and that forms the basis for emotion, mammalian emotionality. The neocortex is something that developed on top of all that, but it's a kind of epiphenomenon in a sense for just figuring out tools so we can get better meat, so we can get access to, you know, we're carnivores, we want the meat, uh, but the, the core really is the, the emotionality of us and what we are. But yeah, definitely. So we can have Zooms. I don't have to drive to your town and you don't have to drive to mine to do these. <laughs> this has been the most amazing thing is I've got caught up on all my interviews because I don't and I don't have to wait till I'm in their town or they're in my town, you know. And I appreciate this, John. Thank you. Are you more afraid of new ideas or old ideas? New ideas, I guess. I, I do have a conservative streak, even though... I love the new, the new, the new, and, and I have, I, I think it is fun, but I always feel like I'm a bit lagging behind. Um, but I, I do think that the danger areas come from the new, especially with the West lack of reluctance to welcome the new. We're the one civilization, I think, in history that just wants the new, the new, the new, and no matter what the cost is. I don't think we care. Um, so that's a, that is a little bit scary, and it does make me a little nervous. Like, what's the next new going to be? cloning humans, um, undoubtedly at some point, uh, that scares the hell out of me. Uh, genetic engineering scares the hell out of me. 
So yeah, I'm the new. Uh, I, I definitely lean toward conservatism, but I do appreciate the new. I mean, I do like the internet. This is fun. <laughs> Let's oh. yeah, it's fun. Once it's you very get, fun. that, and that's the. I think that's the clause here. Once you get used to it, then the new is fun. Yeah, exactly. Yep. Yeah, my favorite kind of music is funk music. And I go, funky is that fun is the key. Words evoke more than their meaning. Uh -huh. This, You really get what this series is about. It's about having fun, you know. Yeah, so, yeah, that, uh, yeah John, fill, it, fill in the blank. I don't know what I think until I. Until I do it. <laughs> I, I got to do it to know what I'm going to think about it. And how many things have I done? that I regret it, you know, after thinking about it, whoops, shouldn't have slept with that girl. Uh, not a good idea. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's funny. Cause I got it from McLuhan says, I don't know what I think until I've said it. And Joan Didion said, I don't know what I think until I wrote it. Ah. And, and, uh, and back to your, uh, just bringing up, you know, um, the uh, female relationship there in regards to your answers. One of my favorite lines of all time is Bridget Bardot. When I, I make love, I don't think. And it's like, good luck. <laughs> you know, here's here's this emo amazing, essential experience. How do you erase thinking? You know, I've gotten in trouble in bed for, for thinking. I, <laughs> I actually literally have had a girl say to me, I can feel you thinking. <laughs> I kid you not. Yeah, this I believe. Yeah, problems. Problems. Yeah. Can you conjure up your earliest memory ever, or one of them? Yeah, yeah, I can. I was probably three years old, and I burned my fingers on the stove. Uh, I, I reached up; it was red, and I knew red meant danger. But then, when it wasn't red, uh, I thought it was okay to touch it, and it was still hot. And so I touched it, burned my hand. And my father was fiercely bandaging my fingers. He was always very rough with me. Um, that's probably my earliest memory. Uh, yeah. Is memory more a curse or more a blessing? Oh, it's definitely a blessing. Um, like I think the distinction between uh, instinct on the one hand and your personal individual memory is a total distinction between a species has to learn through trial and error and it does learn so and then um, the individual organism that comes out, let's say an ant, comes out with these a priori instincts. It's what we call instincts. But in this case, it's the entire species that has learned over long periods of time through trial and error to do this. Whereas with humans, we do have instincts, but we're far more open than other animals are to the imprints of experience, which is me burning my hand on the stove. So I learned never to touch the fucking stove. Don't touch it again. Um, but uh, animals, especially insects, and, and like hive insects, like bees and ants are a classic case. They have a group soul. They seem to know what they're doing as a group. They're very organized, and they, they have learned over time. Uh, their instincts are a trial and error thing that has just gotten imprinted into their group mind. So very different scenarios from, from the human world. Yeah. Amazing, because that uh, doc on... Uh the internet or in uh, Herzog's documentary basically taught me about electric cars that, you know, if your car spins out on ice and it's an electric car, it will put that memory of how to deal with that in every electric car from that point on. Whereas if me or you do a spin out on ice in our car and our mother or dad says, Hey, don't do that. It's only affecting me or you, you know, right. it's affecting every driver from that point on. Which Herzog movie is this? I thought I'd seen all of them. Uh, it's, it's the, the internet movie that is, is, uh, I'll send you the title. Yeah. The 10 minutes, uh, face fatality thing or whatever it is. Uh, I'm not talking. sure that People I'll tell you the while they're driving and okay. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's mainly it's mainly about the internet, and then they go into electric cars a little. Yeah. Um, so tell me your one of your earliest role models 
within your immediate family? And what specifically did you get from them? What was the impact you got from them? Just briefly. And then the second part is outside your immediate family. My immediate family is a tough one because I didn't really have any role models since all the men were very negative individuals. Um, my father, my stepfather, my grandfather, they're all pretty negative. Um, none of them were role models um, and certainly not my mother. Um, I just didn't have a role model in my family. I, I, I knew from early on that these were people who had gone awry and I just knew it, you know, like as a kid knows things. Uh, but outside of my family, my first role model was was Stephen King. Stephen King. I wanted to be Stephen King. I loved his novels. I, I at 12 years old, I started reading them and, and became addicted to them. And I was like, I want to be this guy. I want to write cool fiction like this guy. So, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Did your parents raise you a particular religion? Lutheran, but not rigidly. We went to a few Lutheran sermons, and you know, not rigidly, but. Uh, my family is thoroughly German because both sides are descended from Germans and German was spoken in my mother's household, uh, but but not mine because she failed to learn. She and her brother failed to learn the language. So unfortunately, I, I wish they had because it would have gotten passed on to me and it would have been far easier to learn the language. When I was learning it many years ago, uh, I learned it well enough just to read basic fiction uh, and it would have been a lot easier going if my mother had passed it along to me. So Lutheran. Yeah. Do you pray? Sometimes. Yeah. 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 So sometimes when I feel like I'm totally overwhelmed and I've got a problem and I can't figure out this fucking monkey brain, can't figure out how to solve it. Then sometimes I will. Yeah. 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 John, if God exists, what do you want God to say to you after you die? I hope you didn't waste your time, buddy. <laughs> that's what I wanted to say. I, I hope you didn't waste your time because we granted you this brain and you better have made use of it, not just sitting around drinking or whatever. Uh, yeah. <laughs> that's the one thing I worry about that I just and that if I misuse it, then I might get in trouble, you know, afterwards. Well, I don't think you waste your time. I, I'll write a letter of recommendation or testify. Oh, right. <laughs> yeah. That's I mean, I don't. I would appreciate it. Yeah. Yeah. No, I'm serious because I, I've watched your videos and I go, how do we not know about this guy? I mean, you know, because you really, you know, you get McLuhan and um, we're we're happy for that. And it's hard. You know, we have, if you study Marshall really deeply and, and it goes to that great um, line that McLuhan said, a half a truth is still a lot of a truth. So yeah. just to give a clue in a little is great, but you know, to really get them anyways, I don't want to be elitist or anything. Do evil people exist or does evil use people as a vehicle? I think evil people do exist. Yeah. I, I think that uh, there are some evil people like serial killers, for instance, who just wish people harm and that's innate to them. It's just what they, what they came in here with. Um, and I, I don't think that it's something that you can blame society on or bad parents on. I, I think it's unique to them coming in here with a unique soul inclined toward aggression. Uh, I, I do think that evil is, is, is an essence. It's an essential real thing. Yeah. How do you advise someone to deal with an enemy? And this one I'm going to set up with a few modern thinkers thoughts. Alan Watts says, if you acknowledge your enemy, you empower them. Coppola stole from the mob and the samurais. Keep your friends close and your enemies closer. Yeah. JF, JFK said, forgive your enemy, but don't forget their name. And Fellini said, I need an enemy. So it's a lot of thoughts. The basic question is, John, how do you advise someone to deal with an enemy? But first, how would you respond to the Alan Watts? If you acknowledge your enemy, you empower them. Uh, no, I have a similar thing to what Alan Watts said. I would put it differently uh, and try to go them one better in that I think your enemies are your best friends, actually. Yeah. Because they're teaching you. They're, if, if there's a conflict between you and someone else, uh, then you, you've got a lesson to learn. Something has to be learned, and they're calling you out on it. So I, I think enemies are essential for, for, for growth. Yeah. Yeah, because uh, Ram Das said, I'm having a hard time loving George Bush. <laughs> well, 
Well, then he has something to learn from George Bush. Is what I'm yeah. <laughs> there's, there's something to learn. There. Yeah. So James Joyce was the first projectionist in Dublin over 100 years ago. He basically checked out. He said, this is stupid. Why should I go inside a building and see a movie of a tree when I can go outside and see a real tree? Years later, Faulkner said, sometimes the best fiction is more true than journalism. Why do we have to recreate things in order to get them? Why do we have to go to a theatrical play of people acting out life? Why don't we just live life? Because nobody ever did that before. Put a camera in front of a tree and film it and turn it into human culture. That's the astonishing thing about human culture is that we're always surprising ourselves with what we're capable of and what we can do. Any day you can walk out and go look at a tree. It's not every day you can go into a cinema and look at an image of that tree that's been filmed. The Greeks couldn't do that. The medieval people couldn't do that. The Baroque people couldn't do that. We can. Um, so that, that's, that's the evolution of human culture. It's very important. Well, you, that was good you put it in cinema terms, too, because why did humans invent cinema? To see themselves. It's a kind of, it's a kind of mirror. Um, it presupposes photography. One thing presupposes another, and if photography can capture an image of ourselves for the first time accurately without having to paint it, then let's put that in motion and see what we can see of ourselves in motion. Um, this is why I think that one of the first responses to every new kind of technological transformation in that sense is, what can we do with sex? How can we put sex in here? Oh, photography. Now we can look at uh, beautiful people through photography. Now we can put them in motion and look at them through film. What about space? When is the first couple going to have sex in space? And you're lying to me if, if, if that thought has never occurred to you, because I know that it has. What would zero G sex be like in space? So sex is part of it. <laughs> yeah. We like to see ourselves. We're, we're a voyeuristic species. Yeah. No, it's well done. Um, McLuhan said that uh, advertising is three things, sex, death, and technology. And I... Yeah. I sort of say, well, everything is sex, death, and technology because sex is feeling, emotion, death is time, and technology is everything we put in between us, anything yep. we invent. Yep. So, um, um, complete yeah. agreement. Absolutely. Yeah. Sex death, and technology are almost the whole spectrum. I would just add in their art, you know, and just to complete this, the whole spectrum. But yeah. Yeah. Well, that's interesting. Sex, death, and technology. Technology, but as art is art a technology they're related yeah they're, they're related actually the, the, the first uh some of the first tools that are made called ashulian hand axes which are made by um cromagnon man um are so beautiful they're, they're very large you can hold them in the palm of the hand and they're so symmetrical and beautiful that some uh Analyzers of culture have said, well, these couldn't have been used for anything practical. For one thing, we don't find any wear on them. And for another thing, the mind has invested so much beauty into them, way over what's necessary for them to be practical objects. So technology and art are, are interconnected. That, that's correct. That's 100%. What, what, uh, let's see, what was the motive of the cave artists? Two transformed their world, which had to do with living on animals, hunting them, killing them, eating them. Animals were to them what the internet is to us. It's our whole basic way of life. So they had to take that world and transform it through art because now you have the neocortex in there which can think about this world problematically. So it has to be transubstantiated into something that's beautiful, spiritual, and makes sense out of the whole thing our relationship to the animals. It has to be transubstantiated through art. Amazing. Really well done. Uh, because we've also uh, discussed this uh, phenomenon of the gaze. So we try to study whether the human gaze is more innate or more inventive. What do you think? More innate? More mm -hmm. innate? Yeah. yeah. Because then they go into, you know, Laura Mulvey and, and now Nina Menkins is talking about the female gaze. And so, you know, this is a phenomenon that I'm trying to understand because 
uh, they say that, um, you know, the history of cinema is run by males. Let's just kind of agree on that. But the first woman who like invented narrative in uh, cinemas, like Alice, whatever her name is, there's a documentary about her. Most people don't know about her, and they just sort of blackballed her out of history. So yeah. was she was she dominated male gaze attitude? Because she's there at the beginning. Well, I say, well, maybe she was because most photographers and most painters before her were male. So. Do you think there is a difference between the male gaze and the female gaze? And can you suss that out a little? Yeah, I, I do think there is a difference. It, it is said as a general cliche that men are more visual, women are less visual, which is why men like to look at women so much, naked women especially, uh, because we're more visual, whereas women are more verbal. They're less interested in what a man looks like than in what he says. And I think there's a lot of truth to that. However, I'm, I've been smiling here because I, I do want to throw in a personal anecdote that I might get some flack for, but that's all right. I'm used to getting flack. That um, my, uh, the girlfriend that I had a few years back um, was a webcam model, and a lot of the relationship started with me sort of drooling over her, you know, her webcam porn. So we went through a phase of the relationship that broke up, and then when we reconnected again, um, it, it switched the other way around and she's like, I want you to make me videos of yourself. I was like, yeah, but I've gained weight. I mean, I, I, I've been put on an antidepressant to cause weight gain. She's like, I don't care. I want to see what you look like. So I made her these videos reluctantly and she was like, damn, make me some more of that shit. <laughs> like, Women do have a gaze too. They do. <laughs> they just That's don't amazing. Talk. They just don't talk about it much. Yeah. No, it's amazing because, you know, I I want to believe all that, that, you know, what uh, Laura Milvale and, and uh, Nina Menkins are talking about because the male has established the way we look at things through the lens. But I find a couple of questions come up from your answer. And the first one was some neuroscientists say, that vi uh, I, the visual sense is the most dominant of the five senses. Yeah. Would you agree? In men, I would say in women, it's the olfactory sense. Um, really? Yeah. Women, you would say? Because when I was married, I was married for 15 years, and this woman could smell things that I could only dream about. I mean, let's <laughs> I was like, what do you mean? What do you what do you smell? And she'd be like, I don't want to go into specifics here, but right. <laughs> clearly had a much better olfactory sense than me. That was good, John, because it also brought up a question I rarely ask, but I got it because it fits in. You know, I, I think you've talked about it. The phenomenon that McLuhan talked is light on and light through. So, you know, um, I was lucky to study with the woman um, who actually advised McLuhan on a uh, female Gaia theory, uh, Mary Jane Schultz. And she, she sort of sussed this out a little, but here's what McLuhan would say. TV is light through like a stained glass window. That's right. Right, right brained and more female. So Mary Jane says it's more female film is light on like a mural left brain and more male. So would you agree with the gender ap applications on light through and light on? Yes. That light yeah. Okay. I think she's yeah. right about that because uh, in, in McLuhan's distinction between light through and light on is one of my favorite, one of his ideas because uh, light on, uh, so let's say light through uh, comes from the middle ages with stained glass uh, stained glass in cathedrals where you have light coming through and, and sort of self-illuminating uh, the beautiful world of the saints and angels and so forth. But also the illuminated manuscript, as the name suggests, is also light through. We're illuminating the Bible. We're illuminating the text by pouring light through it to create these beautiful images. Whereas when the printing press comes along now, you need a candle and you have to sit there. You might need glasses and look at the text with light on it. So light has to be on it now. Not, it's not coming through it. 
So now we shed with science, we shed light on things. We look at things, bring they're not, they're no longer self-evident. They're no longer these self-luminous manifestations of a divine world. That we have to look at them. The, the eye has to bring the optic gaze into this thing and analyze the hell out of it for us to understand it. That's light on. And I, I do think that uh, with cinema, then it, cinema is a kind of uh, it's a fusion of, of electric as well as mechanical technology, uh, but it does bring this idea of light on because the whole image is projected on a screen. So it is light on. It is an analytical gaze, whereas with television, it is light through. It is like a like stained glass. You're, you're getting light, electrons coming through, beaming through rapidly, creating those lines to illuminate an image. And the connection with gender, I think, is real. That, uh, that it's right brain versus left brain, and um, the left brain does tend to be more conceptual, more masculine, more... Leonard Schlein talks about this in, in yes. the, the alpha versus the goddess, whereas the right brain is more imagistic, it's more self-luminous. So, no, I, I agree with the gender distinction, though. Yeah, and, and also Mary Jane Schultz invented this word that really, it blew... Bucky, Marshall, Ivan Illich, and Norman Mail are all out of their uh, out, of, out of their male thrones. Splitteracy. So she spelled splitting the left and right brains with an S with a dollar sign. Splitteracy. <laughs> meaning, meaning what now? Splitteracy means what now? Well, that literature split our brains, you know, as part of that process. Of, yeah. of the, you know, causing the right and left, or not uh, caused as much as illustrated. The, the breakdown of the bicameral mind. Uh, That's it. Yeah. Yeah. Good. Yeah. yeah. Just want to make sure I'm following here. <laughs> yeah. 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 No. Well. Well. Mary Jane. She's wild. She said, you know that uh, you 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 know she was saying this back when she was working with McLuhan. You got to watch eight televisions at once in a band. Abandoned books, like books are, you know, obsolete. But she was a literature person. She was just like Marshall. They're literature based, but they start studying the effects of electronic word. So then people think, oh, they love TV, you know. And it's no, we're just trying to suss out what the hidden psychic effects of these things are. Yeah. I remember a lot of interviewers giving McLuhan. Uh, crap about um, oh you're just endorsing all this new yeah. technology. He's like no, actually I'm I'm reacting against it with defense mechanisms. Yeah. <laughs> so I don't let it take over my life. Yes. So a screenwriting teacher told me that great art or great film is when you clearly see the intention of the maker. Kubrick says the opposite. Great film, great art is when you clearly not see the intention. What role does intention play in your creative process? Oh, well, it's the same opposition between James Joyce and Tomas Mann, where James Joyce doesn't want you to know what the intention is. Uh, you can figure it out or not, but Tomas Mann in The Magic Mountain uh, tells you everything that he's doing. And it's interesting because Joyce is Catholic, and traditionally the Catholic priest turns his back to the audience, not anymore, but traditionally turns his back while he's performing the mass because he doesn't give a fuck if you can understand the Latin or not. That's your problem. Whereas with Thomas Mann coming out of the Protestant tradition, which explains everything, explains biblical exegesis, what this passage means, what that passage means, Mann comes along and tells you as you're reading, okay, so here's what this myth means as we're talking about it. So <laughs> it's a difference of those two traditions and also the corresponding temperament. That was good. I learned a lot there and I needed that. That's uh you're forcing <laughs> you're you're forcing me to, into brevity, which I'm not used to, which was like McLuhan's forte, uh, but it's not mine at all. But this is a different experience, uh Jerry. I appreciate it actually. No, I, I I'm really digging it. And uh it reminds me of uh uh Bob Dobbs taught us that um McLuhan converted to Catholicism as a performance art piece. <laughs> Maybe. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, um, uh, Duchamp says there's no art without an audience. How much are you thinking of your audience when you're creating? 
in your creative stage, how much are you thinking? I think about you're that? always thinking of your audience. I don't think that uh, I started as a creative individual from the age of seven. I was writing fiction all the way up until I was 21, 22, something like that. Um, so uh, I was always thinking about, oh, what effect is this story going to have on my friends? What effect is it going to have on my grade school teacher who used to read my stories aloud to the classroom? Uh, what's it going to have on my family? I was always thinking about it. And even as a nonfiction writer and thinker and philosopher, I'm always thinking about, damn, this is a really good sentence here. I wonder what people are going to think of this. Yeah, I'm always thinking about my audience. Yeah, I think it, yeah. the audience is, it, it, you know, any kind of writing that you're doing is always aimed at an audience. You can aim it at yourself, of course, but ultimately you're thinking about what are other people going to think about this? That's interesting because I've studied Frank Zappa a lot for over 50 years, and he basically would say, oh, well, I'm just writing music for myself, and if other people like it, great. But I think he was over-romanticizing the process because he knew if he hit this note and send this word, he'd make money so he could go make more music because he basically just wanted to make music. But who's I think... Who is this? I missed who it was. Uh, Frank Zappa. Oh, Zappa. Okay, gotcha. No. You know, so I mean, he he was over romanticizing that. You know how some artists say, "Well, I just make this for myself," and uh, that actually, lying. yeah, I know oh, they're lying. <laughs> yeah, in <laughs> yeah, in uh, okay, let's go on that one. On what occasion do you lie? Oh, I lie if I think I'm going to get into trouble. You know, <laughs> like in relationships, you got to be careful what you confess to. Uh, because I've learned that you can confess to too much and then it catches up with you later on and it becomes a big fight. So, yeah, I lie if I think I'm going to get in some real trouble. Uh, yeah. But mostly, though, uh, Jerry, I'm the type of person who, who generally doesn't. Um, as, as my audience knows, I, I recently wrote an autobiography. I have this weird compulsion to get everything off my chest. You know, so I'm, I'm sort of like the opposite of a liar. Um I've only lied about a few things to the public, and the public knows most of my personal life story, uh, and some of them are like, enough, Ebert, that's enough, we've heard enough. But still, <laughs> you know, I, I, I have this compulsive need to confess my sins. I don't, maybe it's growing up Protestant, and we didn't have that priest there that we could confess to, so I've displaced it to an audience. <laughs> well, I, I found that intriguing, because just trying to pick you know, knit, you know, a couple of your videos before I interviewed you, I was like, wow, I got it. So I listened to one of those electronic autobiographies and I found it totally fascinating that you would talk all this highbrow philosophy and then all of a sudden you'd go, oh, I'm going to talk about myself because you you anticipated what the, my my interviews are basically trying to get people to jump out of their stock lines and yeah. to go a little deeper, but apply it through themselves and their sort of uh, Rolodex of their mind, you know. So, uh, um, yeah, so this is... Uh, learning, Jerry, I think I'm learning more about myself from this interview than anyone, any any other <laughs> interview before. This is, <laughs> there's some eye-opening <laughs> shit in here. I'm really yeah, having thank you. Well, the thank you. I appreciate it. I mean, I love it when someone gets it because the challenge is, is when someone fights the interview and then I really have to be on my toes, like I have to adjust. And I like that, but it is comfortable. It is comfortable when you, it, it works, you know, it's like. Yeah, some people don't like you prodding into their personal yeah. aspects, whereas I, I love it. It's, yeah. it's fun. <laughs> hey, it's narcissism. I get to talk about myself and you're interested. What a compliment. <laughs> <laughs> and so um, George Manupelli started the Ann Arbor Film Festival 60 years ago. It's the oldest experimental film festival in the world. His mantra was ignore yourself. Jonas Mika, sort of like the East Coast version of him, great experimental filmmaker, film pioneer in New York, said there is no self-expression. And Cecil Taylor, the great avant-garde jazz pianist, said, I'm just a vehicle, and this stuff just comes through me. Mm -hmm. So this question is 
Of course, it's both and it depends, but is art making more self-expression or more you're a vehicle for whatever culture or technology is dominant? As you say, I think it's both. I don't think it's an either, an either or. It's a both and because you are, as an artist, and the greater the artist, the more they are channeling the zeitgeist. Uh, the, the, the larger macrocosmic forces are coming through them. But it always has the stamp of the personal individuality as it, com as it comes through. Um, Joyce is, you know, one of the greatest, if not the greatest, uh, writer of modernity. And he's channeling the whole spirit of modernity through Ulysses and Finnegan's way. But he is Joyce. And he does have very specific idiosyncrasies in the way that he represents things. He likes certain details. He, he likes details about the body. He likes details that are real. Um, Joyce doesn't like to lie. He likes to portray the world exactly as it is, plus spiritual forces going through it. So it, it's kind of a, a balance of, of both, I would say. Maybe yeah. you can't get one without the other. I don't yeah, know. No. That was well put. And then can art making be egoless? I don't think so. But now, now that you ask that, um, in India, maybe, uh, because the idea in India was that as you're creating these statues and sculptures, if you want to create a dance of Shiva statue, you have to do it the way the canon says you do it. You don't get to do it your own unique way. Maybe the style might be slightly inflected in your direction, but basically you have to represent the archetype as other artists before you have done it, which is a, as close as you're going to get to an egoless art. So it, it's possible. I think it's possible. It depends on the culture. Was Freud right? Yeah, sex is, it's a, <laughs> I'm afraid he was. Sex is a big one. It's, it's a major, major motivation for uh almost everything we do sex is in there uh, i would say it's priority number two after eating you gotta eat to feed yourself and but then you have to reproduce to take care of the species so fred was right insofar as he went i, I think he was right in that sex sex is a big one so I spoke with Michael Apted, the great uh, experiment, uh, uh, documentarian and the uh, Hollywood movie director. He just died in the last year. Um, and uh, he made a documentary on a Russian rock star. And it was right 40 years ago when MTV was breaking big. And uh, he, he said, uh, I said, why do video rock video editors feel so obliged to edit fast? He said, well, we can, because we've learned to take in information faster. And it was right when Marty Scorsese was saying, I'm editing my films faster because of MTV. Can we, lit can humans literally learn to take in information faster or are we just brainwashed to believe we can? No, uh, no, I, I think there's some truth to this. Um, and I think Oliver Stone probably edited faster than anyone ever did in the history of cinema, especially starting with JFK and then Natural Born Killers and U-Turn. Those are films that astonish me with, with the, the editing skill. It's very rapid images. They, they just channel surf very quickly. And those were all made in the 90s and it can't be an accident that they correspond with the time of the internet coming into being and us absorbing a lot of information, but in a very shallow way. So it's image information that uh, Stone is dealing with and yes, Scorsese's editing does speed up, but it's nothing compared to Stone's. Yeah. Um, and it, but it's image information, which on the surface can be very shallow, until you take a McLuhan approach and you say, and McLuhan says of a myth, which is the same thing as an image. He says a myth is a compression of a complex process that, if you want to talk about it, has to be unfolded sequentially through concepts and ideas that takes time. But a myth can compress it all at once. So um, as with it, like, for instance, the myth of uh, the invention of the alphabet with Cadmus, uh, Cadmus bringing the alphabet to Greece, there, there's a whole compression of processes that are going on there all simultaneously in that myth. But to talk about the myth, you got to take some time to do it. Whereas with the images, it's all at once. And I think film is uh, at the end of the 1990s, that was its thing, was the speed up of the 
the laps of the cuts, cut, 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 cut. That's with stone. Whereas if you watch a traditional European film, it's cut, cut, <laughs> cut. But stone is going cut, 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 cut. And at the same time, he's overdosing on cocaine. <laughs> so that can't, <laughs> that can't be an accident either. But, uh, yeah, yeah my, my friend used to smoke pot with him all the time. So that's funny because you know who invented rapid montage, just to add an aside really quick, was Abel Gantz in 1920s. Yeah, that's right. You're right. No, so, but, but it, didn't, it didn't catch on. So here's the thing. You brought up something really important I wanted to go off script and talk to you about that I've just been thinking about recently. So John Cage was turned onto the wake by Marshall McLuhan. And he says, oh, I get it because I'm going to do this technique I invented called writing through, which means I'm going to condense it and satirize it. And we, I goes, well, we all baby boomers know that because we read Mad Magazine. Why go see Rocky in a movie theater when you can just read Mad Magazine satirization of it in a couple pages? So I've been learning through studying the wake that, um, and my friend who's deep into William Blake, it, it, that we have the ability to create new myths. But then Willa Cather in The Writer's Journey by Christopher Vogler, the guy who took Campbell and changed Hollywood with his book. And what I say is he ruined Hollywood through, James Joyce ruined Hollywood because he made George Lucas, Star Wars and Jaws and Close Encounters, enabled all the new screenwriters to apply Campbell to their myth making. So they were just recycling old myths. And in his book, it's Will Cather's quoted as saying, there's only three or four stories. So is the, I know it's complicated. I'm at gobbledygooking all over the place, but is it really that there's only a few myths and we're just regurgitating them? Or is it really possible to invent new myths? Uh, interesting. <laughs> Great question as usual. Uh, Two answers. I, I think there's two myths, <laughs> specifically two, which Campbell yeah. out uh, the monomyth and the cosmogonic myth. The cosmogonic myth simply has to do with creation myths, how gods created the world. So that's one type of myth. But the other is the monomyth, which is the hero's journey. And I do think that is absolutely universal. I've read uh, quite a bit of universal uh, world literature, the Mahabharata, the Ramayana, you know, uh, the Shah Nama from all these different cultures and they all have this hero myth where the hero leaves a, a desperate situation a village is being besieged or has a drought and, and then has to go through an initiation through very difficult tests and trials and then finds what was missing from that society and returns back to that society with the boon which heals the wasteland um, i think that's a pretty common myth um, i think there are only two myths really and those are the two and i think campbell nailed them in his book, The Hero with the Thousand Faces, which came out in 1949. I don't see the influence of him on Hollywood as disastrous. I see it the other way around. Uh, it's a different thing. Yeah, Hollywood, Hollywood before the, the Campbell invasion of it, via, uh, it started Star with Kubrick. Yeah. Kubrick and then Lucas, um, is a different thing because before then, Films were based on books, and they had a literate mentality, especially stuff like the French, like Godard and the, the French auteurs. And so it, you, you had to be literate to understand Bergman and Godard and, and Michelangelo and Tonioni, these types of guys. These are literate sensibilities translated into the film. But the roller coaster cinema that starts with Jaws and Star Wars is a different kind of cinema that I actually prefer, even though I'm a literate guy that I actually prefer because when I go to cinema, I want a different experience. Uh, I've got books at home to read. I can have that literate experience at home. When I go to cinema, I want to strap in the seatbelt and take me for a ride, dude. That's what I want. I want Jaws, I want Star Wars, I want empires marching and clashing. I want special effects. <laughs> I think they understood this, the, the cinematic possibilities of the mythical consciousness structure and what you could do with it. Um, I'm not saying that I don't like Kurosawa, uh, 
Yeah. <laughs> but it's just a different mentality. That's all. No, you laid the cards on the table and you talk. Go back for a second, John. Monomyth versus how do you spell the other myth? Cosmo, what did you call it? Cosmogonic, the genesis of a cosmos. Cosmogonic. C O S M O G O N I C? Yes. Uh -huh. yes okay, right. great. So now a couple other quickie uh, inserts was, you know, I'm fond of these people who are alchemists. I know you follow them too. Like Preston yeah. Sturgis, to me, he invented um, what's called screwball comedies. So he, he sort of changed Hollywood a little and was the writer and the director. And he combined whatever two things. The better example is Frank Zappa. Frank Zappa basically combined theatrics and rock. So he invented theatrical rock. What both of they both of them did was they invented a new genre and then they satirized their own genre. So the question is, can satire be destructive? Uh, it can be, although with Aristophanes, you know, you, <laughs> in the Greek world, you get uh, Aeschylus and Sophocles first, and then the, 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 the creation of Greek tragedy. And then Aristophanes comes in and satirizes it. But Aristophanes is generally regarded as as great as those other two guys. So I don't think it's necessarily destructive. Although I will say this regarding satire is that when you get to the tail end of a medium, it starts to become satirical. You start getting satires of itself. Like, for example, the, uh, the James Bond genre starts to become satirized with some of the Tom Cruise spy films. They, they start becoming so ridiculously over the top with the stunts and the special effects. And now you know you're, you're not really watching a James Bond movie. This is a, this is a, a parody of, of a James Bond movie. Um, same thing with like uh, Mel Brooks' uh, parody of Star Wars called Spaceballs. Yeah. Uh, you, you get to a point where the genre is so ridiculous that it has to be satirized. So usually the appearance of satire represents the end of the development. Really well put. My friend who wrote uh, for Robin Williams and Mork and Mindy said, can satire be destructive? He says, that's the job of satire. <laughs> you know, and, you, know you, 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 you sussed oh, it out well. I, I was the most disappointed man on the planet when I heard about his suicide. I was like, yeah. My, so brother, my brother and I were his, like two of his biggest fans. And, oh, yeah. And he, he was devastated. I was devastated. I was like, Dude, you have to be kidding me. Yeah. And so, um, well, I'll tell you a great story. Rick Overton uh, knew him, a, a great L.A. comedian. And uh, he, he uh, Robin uh, ripped off, let's just say, one of his jokes. And Rick approached him and he says, dude, you ripped off my joke. He whipped out his checkbook and wrote him a check for $5,000. He says, here. <laughs> and Rick was like, yeah, dude, thank you. Because most guys would have been in defense mode and gone, go fuck yourself. You know, right. <laughs> that's that's a that's a decent guy right there. That very <laughs> decent. And so let's go to Kubrick for a second because you brought him up. And this is a stupid question again, but I had James Harris, you know, sitting right here, interviewed him with all these stupid questions, and he produced like eight things with Kubrick. And basically, Stanley pulled clockwork orange from uk screens only for 30 years because the cops can't, the the u.s the british cops came to him and said you've got to pull this so it's, it's, it, did he pull it because he really believed his films were causing kids to beat up winos or he did it because he knew it was a good publicity stunt i mean i know I both but i don't think that kubrick would ever have thought that the images were causing violence. Um, right. they, were, they were reflecting what was going on in the society already. Um, yeah. So I don't that, that he was thinking that it would make things worse, but that it would rather bring to people's attention, look, this is what we look like now. Do we like this? Do we like how we look right now? Because yeah. it's, it's not too attractive. And, but I think that the, the move of, of pulling the film was just something that he had to do for his career because it didn't look good. All these newspaper yeah. articles connecting wannabe Malcolm McDowell's 
you know, with their crimes. And it just looked bad for him, I think. I, I think it was more ego motivated than anything else. Yeah. James said Stanley was into two things, film and family. He didn't want these kids to come and beat up his family. <laughs> it is true. Yeah, his, his family was very important to him. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Another filmmaking uh, what if question. Louis Bunuel showed up at the screening of like Lodge Door or and Shun on Delu with rocks in his pocket because they, they rioted. They threw rocks at the screen and ripped up the art in the, in the hallway of the movie theater. And uh, was he carrying the rocks in his pocket to help start the riots or to protect himself when they go, he's the filmmaker, get him. <laughs> well, I, I've seen both of those films, but I don't know that much about Louis Budden Wells, so I, I can't answer that question. Yeah, but what's your hunch, no, what's your hunch say? How I would you it. feel? I doubt it, my hunch says I doubt it. <laughs> you doubt I that, it. you doubt which way, that he was helping start the riot or protect himself? Protecting himself. I, yeah. I, I, yeah, exactly. Yeah, a sensation is a good thing for Dada. Isn't that yeah. what Dada was all about? Was causing yeah. sensations and getting attention, uh, and making fun of art. And, yeah. Yeah. In general, what's more important, conviction or compromise? Conviction or what? Compromise. Oh, conviction by far. Yeah, absolutely. That's an yeah. easy one, Jerry. I mean, <laughs> on. these are getting easier and easier now. Okay. <laughs> no, he is as long as you, I think self-confidence has a lot to do with the success of people in the world. The more self-confident you are that the vision that you have is correct, the better the results, I think, are going to be. Uh, and compromise is just, it's, it's a way of just butchering your work. Oh, like it's too bad with Orson Welles that the magnificent Ambersons got so compromised, you know, that they, they, they cut the shit out of that film. And as, and what's left is just brilliance. But as you're watching it, you go, you go, something just disappeared. Something's missing. There's a, should be a transition here. And so he, he really allowed the studios to get in there and mangle that film. It's really too bad. Well, no, I don't know if he allowed, this is a great theory that I've, uh, they, have I've allowed. Allowed. they have yeah. more power, obviously. Yeah. They, they always no, do. but it, but it, it was a great word you used, John, because I've asked four major uh, Wells associates, you know, Peter Bogdanovich, Gary, yeah. uh, you know, uh, all these people. And I said, my theory is that um, Rockefeller hijacked uh, Magnificent Ambersons by shipping Wells to Brazil to make that Brazil documentary while Magnificent Amersons was being edited. And he said, well, we'll ship you the parts. You can edit Magnificent Amersons down there. And then Robert Wise took over, edited it, and made it not a diss on the bourgeois. And Wells was dissing the bourgeois with the film. So they hijacked his message. And I asked all four of them, and they, they all four of them said, that's evident. So I didn't know this detail. So the Robert Wise uh, was in charge of cut, cutting that film down? He cut he cut Magnificent Ambersons, yep. Oh, he should be it, a champion. So well, um, that's the other thing. I never get that, a that gave a genius. That that dude was a genius. Yeah. Wizard of Oz and uh, you know No, uh, Robert Wise is a great filmmaker. I'm not denying him that. And my, that's I don't mean to demonize him, but as much as Rockefeller sort of was overseeing uh the 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 production of um the Brazil doc and maybe the timing. Anyways, it's a sort of uh, high fluent, you know, uh, theory. But it was fun when I asked Bogdanovich, Gary Gutman, um, Henry Jaglum, and Eric Sherman. Uh, oh, three, okay. three out of four of them pretty much agreed. It's it's a valid theory. And, and Bogdanovich knew Wells very well, so I'm, oh, I'm curious. Of, like, so what was his response to this? He he them. said, "Yeah, it prob they, they they probably did hijack." Wells's uh, diss on the bourgeois that okay. it was it was it was the higher ups, you know. Gotcha. Yeah, yeah. Um, so is perception reality? Yes, it is. Yeah. I think if you if you perceive things a certain way, they're going to be that way. If you, uh, um, I'll quote uh, from an Oliver Stone film, U-turn. 
uh, if you think bad, bad's what you're going to get. <laughs> wow. I think, that's, I think that's correct. I think that's right. Well, that's perfect lead into this question. You create what you resist. So you sort of answered it, but I'd like to get a little deeper. Um, this is a saying. Bob Goldthwaite, the comedian, morphed it into you are what you hate. And James Joyce said, it's a curious thing how your mind is super saturated with the religion in which you say you disbelieve. And Louis Bunuel nailed it. He said, thank God I'm an atheist. So how do you respond to this thought? You One creates what one resists. You create what you resist. Interesting question. I like this idea where Joyce says that um, your religion that you disbelieve in you know, shapes your because it's, I've noticed, like, for example, Francis Ford Coppola comes from an Italian Roman Catholic background in which he disbelieved. But look at the Godfather films. What, what are they? Is it an excavation of Roman Catholicism and one of its modalities, the mafia? Um, Spielberg, you know, making all of his films about uh, Jewish consciousness with Schindler's List. And he was a lapsed Jew. He didn't really care that much about it. Uh, but here we have Schindler's List and all these World War II movies which are very conscience-driven films. Um, so your upbringing does shape you, even if you disown it, it still shapes your sensibilities off the world. And then this phenomenon that the art that really succeeds seems to be people revealing their weaknesses or their failings. And why is that? Because it's like, well, we want to promote healing and not suffering, but does the suffering di di dictate the highest arts? Like, is that an important ingredient? Well, does the weakness that you're talking about, is does, is it coming from the artist, or is it the artist's mirror of a social weakness in, in the outer world? Which one are we talking about? Well, John, you win because the point of this interview is to invent new questions. Great. <laughs> I, I, I'll... I'll I'll go, I'll go to the John Cage answer. That's a very good question. I wouldn't want to ruin it with an answer. <laughs> no, no you, there, you, there's something to it. There's something yeah, to you it. Put, you yeah. put it in the context you want. Yeah. Uh, like a clockwork orange reveals the weakness of where we're at socially with yeah. all the, the gang violence yeah. and youth violence. It is a film about our weaknesses. 2001 a space odyssey is a film about our worshiping in, in place of mammon technology um and our weaknesses that it's going to debilitate us as humans and maybe compromise our spirituality where we're trying to get beyond you know in 2001 the whole point is that the technology okay it was great while it lasted it got us to a certain point but it's like um we need that divine super child who comes in at the end which is Yates' rough beast slouching towards Bethlehem, right? The new Messiah who will bring spirituality back because we've weakened and debilitated ourselves with technological overextensions. Um, so I think this is one of uh, Stanley Kubrick's leading themes. Uh, in Full Metal Jacket, once again, you can find uh, this idea of debilitation and weakness. The Vietnam War has really compromised uh, the United States' sense of itself as a self-confident country that's all-knowing, wise, and humanistic, but yet look at this war. Uh, it doesn't seem to <laughs> it doesn't seem to glorify that image of ourselves coming out, you know, from uh, Franklin and Jefferson and Washington. Uh, some, something's wrong here. Something's not right. So I, I do think, yeah, a lot of great films and great art does come out of a recognition of the weakness of where we're at, uh, and artists pointing that out. It, it's a way of Again, holding the mirror up to ourselves and saying, is this really what we want? Is this how we want to be? Um, yeah. yeah. That's good. That's positive attitude. And that's uh, Auden, the poet, said the, the mystery of art is that we don't know if it activates or pacifies us. So like John Waters rooted for the Wicked Witch of the West. He became a famous and great filmmaker. So, you know, yeah, well, who are you supposed to root for, the bad guy or the good guy? <laughs> he would root for the Wicked Witch of the West. I, I never knew that, but it's totally consistent with him. He would um, do that. <laughs> yeah, not a surprise at all. 
yeah, it just depends. I, I mean, yeah. yeah, all of that is, is a, a very relative thing. It depends on your point of view and what the artist is after, what mirror, what it's like every artist has, is gifted with the ability to show society from a different angle. You know, they, <clears throat> they all look at it from different angles. And so the sum total of a zeitgeist, let's say the zeitgeist of modernism is add up all these mirrors and see what that portrait looks like of us. Um, it's interesting. This is where we're at. Do we like it? Do we like ourselves in modernity? Um, so I think that's what the artist's task is, is to hold up the mirror to, to a particular society and show us what we look like. Because so much of what we're going through in our daily rounds is, like, like we said before, subliminal. We're not aware of it because it's environmental. And if something is environmental, you're not aware of it unless there's a storm. So then a storm comes in and changes the environment. Now you're aware of it. The storm's really loud. And that's sort of what the artist is doing, bring, bring in the storms. Really well put. Um, John, I also evoked Paul Schrader, you know, wrote Taxi Driver, said the role of the artist is to attempt to sell out but fail. <clears throat> well, that might be a projection from his own career. I mean, <laughs> it's so tough being an artist in Hollywood and not selling out. And he sold yeah. out a few times. Oh, but yeah. oh, overall, I think, if you look at his herb, um, and he wrote most of the screenplays for, for Scorsese movies and, and a lot of original screenplays, that, some of which he directed, um, he did a pretty good job, actually, of not yeah. selling out. Oh, overall, yeah. not selling yeah. out. But on occasion, he would. That's just Hollywood. Yeah. It's, Business versus commerce. Yeah. So Moshe Feldenkrais works with healing and movement. He says it's literally possible to identify a weakness and incorporate it to become a strength rather than we're normally taught to overcome a weakness. Tell me a weakness you've turned into a strength. Oh, a weakness was my social inabilities. As I was growing up, I was always painfully shy absolutely terrified when a teacher would call me up in front of the class in high school to give a book report or any kind of report on anything. It was my worst nightmare. So that was a major weakness that I turned around now to the point where I love talking in front of people. It's, <laughs> it's a strength now. It's, yeah. Yeah. So. But how, how did you, did you have to find courage to do that? Or what yeah. was the epiphany that turned you around? It was just a slow, gradual process of becoming more and more self-confident through reading more and more books and realizing when I'm in conversation with somebody, actually, I know what I'm talking about now. I didn't before. So people used to push me around, especially in high school, because I didn't know what I was talking about. And so they would push me around. They can't do that anymore. I know what I'm talking about because I've logged in the hours. It's like Eddie Van Halen. He was such a great guitarist because he logged in the hours teaching himself yep. how to play that motherfucking thing better than anyone <laughs> on the planet, you know. And, and so, of course, he's so self-confident. Look, listen to this guy. You know? yeah. <laughs> so, it was, you know, something like that, I suppose. <clears throat> well put. T.S. Eliot said, poetry is outing your inner dialogue. What language is your inner dialogue in? Myth. It, it, my inner dialogue is always in mythical images. I, I see a lot of things, especially as I'm falling off to sleep. You, you asked a question about falling off to sleep earlier. As I'm falling off to sleep, where I start seeing all my problems from the day transformed into mythical images that don't make any rational sense or paradigms. And I'll be like, sometimes it'll wake me up and I'll be like, what the fuck did that just mean? <laughs> But, but it'll make a kind of sense, you know? And yeah. I'll be like, all right, I suppose some other part of me is making sense out of this shit because I'm not. Um, yeah. <laughs> so That's good. It's probably like, what did you say it uh, helps to build our immune system? Um, complaining yeah. or, and probably dreaming helps build our thinking ability. That's what I've yeah, heard. I think it does. Yeah, I, I think you're right about that. The, the dreams are essential to problem solving abilities when you get back up out of that in the daytime. Now you're equipped with some more tools. Uh, you don't even realize it. You just do it. 
but I, I think the dreams are essential to equipping you with problem solving tools. Yeah, John, I asked for 90 minutes. Can you go a little longer? I, I can. <laughs> this is one of oh, the best well, interviews I've ever had. So, well, yeah. I appreciate it. But uh, it, it, I mean, what it, what's ideal? You want to go 10 minutes, 20 minutes, or 30 minutes more? Just give me a ballpark. 15 sounds good. Okay, 15 is perfect. That helps a lot. How do you find peace of mind? Through studying art and culture and understanding what it means uh, to build civilizations. That that makes me happy. Learning those connections. Yeah. You know, you brought this up earlier. That was an amazing little point. You said you burned your hand as a kid. So there's a McLuhan line that I'm going to read to you and tell you what I think it means. And then you tell me what you think it means. And it goes like this. Everybody experiences far more than they understand. Yet it is experience rather than understanding that influences behavior. So I will give this example. I'll say the kid comes in from the cold winter and he's, his parents say, don't touch the stove, the red hot flame. It will burn your hands. Rather than saying, let me teach you the dynamics of heat. I want you to understand that you can get really close to the, the flame and warm your hands up. So I think what McLuhan is saying is that understanding should shape our behavior, but we let in experience shape our behavior. Well, yeah, I, I mean, he has an excellent point there, uh, which is that experience, nothing, uh, Nietzsche actually says this, Nietzsche, Nietzsche does, that pain is the best teacher. You will never learn a better lesson from th than when pain is involved. You'll never forget it. You'll never forget it. So pain is the best teacher, I think. Understanding has to catch up to that. I think understanding is a later thing. Um, I, I, this is why I think that pain is so essential in our lives on, on the bigger scale, not just touching the stove, but on the bigger scale, dealing with people, hurting someone, them hurting you, that, that teaches us the larger picture about what we're doing here on this planet with each other. Yeah. If you were walking down the street today and you met yourself as a 12-year-old, what would you say to your 12-year-old self? I would have said, dude, read Plato. Stop reading Stephen King right now. Read Plato. Because <laughs> I get jealous when I read biographies of like famous intellectuals and they're already reading Plato and Aristotle and Shakespeare in their teens, which I didn't read until my 20s because I was reading comic books and horror fiction. You know, I was like, I, I wish I could have started with them, you know, as early as they did. Maybe I'd be smarter. I don't know. Yeah, but that's the interesting thing. I, I feel that same way too, but it's like maybe because you had to go through the Stephen King to lead you to the Plato, because if you started with Plato, you might have ended up with Stephen King or something different. So it's hard to say. That's a good point, Jerry. Yeah, it yeah. was probably necessary for my development somehow. Yeah. Now, these are five Alan Watts questions, just briefly in like three to five words. I refuse to answer any Alan Watts questions. <laughs> just a joke i'm fine no, you know no, what know. have you ever have you ever studied the uh a compassionate trickster carolyn casey no i have not oh i've got to turn you on to she is amazing and she when i asked her this just like a couple of weeks ago she did that to me and she started dissing at lots and i i loved it because they're they're funny little questions and I could see where she didn't want to go there. So it, you not like Alan Watts. That's the whole irony of my 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 question there. How can you? How can anybody not like this? He was awesome. <clears throat> yeah. Well, he was a womanizer and an alcoholic. They say, yeah. and, and you know, whatever. Yeah. Like I've listened to him. I'm an alcoholic too, Jerry. <laughs> <laughs> so you're detracting. No, I, I'm not. Yeah, I'm, just, I'm, I'm not you. trying to make value judgments. I'm just saying I understand what you're saying because Pacifica Radio plays them every Sunday morning, and it's like religion to me. It's like I listen to them on I the have, radio. 
heard a bunch of his lectures. I haven't read any of his books, but I've heard a bunch of his lectures and been astonished by them. Yeah. He was so good as a public yeah. speaker. Uh, yeah. You could get a better public speaker than that guy. And at one yes. point, when I was working with the Joseph Campbell Foundation, uh, they had me work with his son, Mark Watts, on yeah. editing some of his stuff. So I have had the privilege of listening to a bunch of his lectures. And wow, is he fantastic. Oh, yeah. So here we go. First one is who started it all? God. That's easy, Jerry. I mean, <laughs> these, have got, these have got to be harder. <laughs> are, are we going to make it? Yes, because that's part of the plan. They're initiated from God. There is an omega. I think Chardin had this right, that there's an omega point that we're trying to get to. It's going to take us a while, but we will get there as a species. I, I, I'm fully optimistic about that. Very good. We'll get to it. And where do we put it? The Omega Point? Under our belts? Oh, yeah. I mean, basically. <laughs> basically yeah. Know. No, that's good because, you know, the, all five questions by Alan has the word it in it. So a lot of times people are wondering what it is it. So where do we put it? The next one is who's cleaning it up? Well, we have to. And like with the world, World War One and Two, it was such a fucking mess that we made out of the planet, and we've been stuck ever since then with cleaning it up for 60, 70 years, whatever it is now, cleaning it up. And as a species, we've done not too bad a job for an such an apocalyptic war of cleaning it up. Yeah. And the last Alan Watts is: Is it serious? It's deadly serious. But I'll quote Goethe here. Uh, when he was telling someone about Faust, and he was writing Faust, and he said, here are these deadly serious jests. <laughs> so I, I think that's what it is. Deadly serious jests. Oh, my God. That is good because of what, another guy I I wish we could go into for – we should do another one just on William Irwin Thompson. But We can. You know, you, oh, oh, Thompson? Yeah. Thompson you know him. My mentor. So yeah. you're <laughs> – that's yeah, uh, I know. I know you're, 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 for the next one. You're right. Oh, yeah. word. But, um, uh, the, the other guy is uh, Gurdjieff says, um, laughter is the reconciliation of yes and no. Yeah, there's always, I remember Schopenhauer saying something like that that there's laughter uh, uh, emerges out of surprise. It's like uh, yeah. it, it moves the mind into a space that the brain doesn't get, but the laughter does. Irony contradictions uh yeah 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 laughter so, is one, i think laughter is one of the blessings of our species that oh, yeah. one of the, that, that we're equipped with that that make life worth living i i love laughter uh yeah huge sense of humor i i, I grew up uh listening to all kinds of stand-up comedians steve martin uh, richard pryor you know george carlin uh, those guys are part of my intellectual development. I, I love them. Yeah, yeah I was. Lucky. Yeah, I was lucky. I worked for George Carlin for a half a year, and he said to me, well, "Did you?" Yeah, he There's said no, to me, "The respect meter just went up." Uh, but he's, yeah. he's, <laughs> it he's, just he's, went up. Yeah, you know, I I have to brag a second. He said to me at one point, "I'm gonna learn a lot from you," and I said, "Could I put that on my gravestone?" <laughs> Yeah, um, right. Carlin was brilliant. All yeah, so, are, they're, they're all so, uh, the, the thing about the best uh, stand-up comedians is what strikes you about them is how high their IQs are. These oh, guys yeah. are really smart, all the way down to like Louis C.K. They're, they're really bright guys. Um, yeah. yeah. They articulate the human condition. So you touched on this, and I'm going to ask you this one, and then we'll bring Clinton in. I sort of screwed Clinton. He's He's got to, got to get in here a little, too. But here's the last question I have before we bring Clinton. Joseph Boys, the artist, said, make the secrets productive. Lou Welsh, beat poet, ad man, said, guard the secrets, constantly reveal them. But it was Thornton Wilder in 28 said, art is confession. Art is the secret told, but art is not only the desire to tell one's secret, it's the desire to tell it and hide it at the same time. 
John, you've laid your cards on the table for 90 minutes. I'm grateful. I'm not insinuating you haven't. What's it really all about for you? Art, poetry, sex, literature. These are the awesome things. I mean, <laughs> things that I don't care about, money, politics, the business world. I don't give a shit about that world. But that, those are my things. And um, yeah. those are the things that cheer me up and enlighten me uh, and teach me about what it means to be alive on this planet. Yeah. All right, Clinton, where are you? He's off. This guy actually <laughs> listens to these. <laughs> Yeah, he should be. I don't know where he is. The Yushi pop. There he is. Yay. We've got okay. him back. Fantastic, man. This has been a I've learned a lot, guys. This has been fan fantastic. And um I see you've got a 13 year YouTube career under your belt there. A very um erudite. I've noticed that you were using the word um zeitgeist with a, it's it's clear that you've got a very formalized, well thought out idea underlying um, something of the idea of, you know, from, you know, breath to communication to consciousness to this, you know, substance of myth within which uh, we dwell. And I'm all, all my McLuhan studies sort of pivot around that point as well. So I, I was wondering, um, what is information the way that we think about it in so far as uh, you know in the post cybernetic post uh, cloud sharing and information theory um, thermodynamics me metaphor way is information the way we talk about it today just a catchword for zeitgeist as no. no i don't think so in information reverses entropy so uh, when you have information and you maximize in information you get rid of noise because in the classic model, the Shannon Weaver model of communication, there's always a sender and a receiver. And in between, there's that problem of noise. There's mm -hmm. always degradation uh, mm -hmm. of signal. And I think with information, information is maximized when noise is reduced, whatever it is, whether it's you're talking to someone on the phone and you hear static and it's degrading the signal, or when you're having a communication and this guy, this motherfucker just isn't understanding you. <laughs> oh, yeah, oh, yeah. <laughs> that's, that's noise, that's the creation of the signal. But um, the human species thrives on information, correct information, good information. Because if information is good, it proves itself by materializing itself. You get the fourth dynasty pyramids in Egypt. That's good information. We got good information here because we are materializing these pyramids and they are edifices of perfection of absolute geometrical perfection. So when the information is good and the noise content is low, you get miracles. You get physical manifestation of human ideas that are incredible. You get the right information, you get the skyscraper. You get the right information, you get the Greek temple. Um, so information is very important in the degradation of life. You have to get, minimize the noise content. Um, and information is extremely important. Yeah, good question. By the way. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, this sounds like a uh, this sounds like a theory of art, meaning more art artifice, such to include engineering, even. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Oh yeah, absolutely, it's engineering because uh, the original purpose of architecture is to materialize spiritual ideas, not uh, practical ideas as skyscrapers are, at a later phase in our civilization, but to materialize spiritual ideas. This idea that the pyramid, let's say, is, is the mound, the primordial mound that emerges after the Nile floods and then recedes. And then we get the first mud mound, which represents rebirth out of the flood. Okay, we put the king in this thing and he's gonna be reborn amongst the stars. That's the, the materialization of an information content that is high, high in content, low in noise. Mm -hmm, that's great. Um, that jives well with uh, Swiss architecture, uh, with Siegfried Gid Gideon. Gideon who, yeah. It's, it's yeah. basically in architecture. I'm so glad you mentioned that book. That was one of the best books ever written on architecture. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Fantastic. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Oh, God. I, I, I could do this all all day, Jerry. Um, yeah, we're, we're, we'll definitely. He, he, already, he already signed up for. Um, what we do is when Clint's here for the yeah yeah no 
Yeah, you guys are awesome. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, when Quinn's here for the whole 90 minutes, it's called a McLuhan mashup. So you did a mess. That's the interview. So we'll do a mashup. But just to follow up, it's funny because um, McL McLuhan knew that all these cute aphorisms that we all can roll off, you know, nice quotes that illustrate things compactly. Marshall knew that the important thing about an aphorism is when you reword it or reinvent it. It has a great little epiphany, but how do we take it a little step farther? So he took from Winston Churchill, we shape our buildings, then they shape us. And he turned it into, we shape our tools, then they shape us. And so uh, just a couple follow-up end questions now, um, John, thank you. Is Bertel Breck said that, you know, I don't want, art that puts you in a trance. I want art that activates you. But isn't the, the full spectrum that when we do have noise, when we do have something that puts you in a trance, you can flip that into an epiphany. So isn't it having suspended judgment and taking all of them the worthy way to go? Or, you know, I don't know what I'm trying to say with the question, but go ahead. No, it's, no, it's really good uh, because what I like about this question is, that, um, yeah, art, art does have this kind of twofold aspect to it, putting you into a trance and narcotizing you. It's like getting stoned and listening to Wagner. You're just in another world. Your brain's not in, along for the ride. You're just in another world. Or, on the other hand, reading James Joyce, where your, your mind has to be really involved in what you're reading. So it's an intellectual transformation in reading Joyce. But both are involved. And when I think about some of the most intellectually formative experiences of my life, some of them were my LSD experiences when I was 16 years old. Uh, I was 16 years old and mm -hmm. had never read anything but Stephen King, horror fiction, science fiction. And then we're out in the middle of the desert. We take LSD and suddenly the whole universe is a go painting. The whole universe is a revelation. My brain doesn't know how to translate it. it. It's crippled. It's not there. But I'm having the experience of awesomeness, just pure awesomeness. And it isn't until years later, when I look back on it, that I could bring my brain in and go, oh, I was learning that the world is that we see is not all there is. There's, there's a spiritual dimension behind all this. That's what I was learning in that experience that I was naive to and didn't, it didn't rise to my conscious perception. So art can do that. Art can put you in a trance. But I guarantee you that that trance will later mean something to you. Um, yeah. Whether it's watching Apocalypse Now stoned, let's say, or, or whatever. Later you'll go, oh, fuck, I, I just I realized what that meant. Uh, the, the brain is always late to get up. <laughs> it's the late yeah. coming. In any experience, whether it's a sexual experience, a hallucinogenic experience, or a terrible physical experience, uh, the brain always catches up later, but it does catch up. You, know, that uh, really, you can be sure of that. It will catch up. And, uh, it'll want to what did that mean? What did that experience mean? So, yeah. Brilliant. Just two quick last ones. What's the healthiest cultural shift you see developing today? The shift in all the local religions combining and colliding and clashing, and I'm hoping one planetary religion will come out of all those clashes. I'm hoping it'll be just one global experience that will unite all of us together the same way that Muhammad united the Arabic tribes who were fighting with each other by coming up with a single vision for them. And he said, here, we're, we shouldn't be fighting. We're all on the same page. Here's the image. I think the same thing should happen to this planet. That's, that's what I'm hoping for, that it will be a single world religion that will come out of the collision of all these local ethnic religions. Beautiful, thanks, John. And the last question is, what gives you the most optimism? The most optimism is that the human mind is capable of so much learning. You know, I think we're better people now than we were 100 or 200 or 500 years ago because we've gone through these processes and collective traumas, the French Revolution, the world wars, I think the world wars especially have taught us, we don't want to treat each other like this. We're, we're better than that. We have human rights now. 
Uh, we have a concern that everyone is treated compassionately as a result of these wars. And I think that indicates something special about us as a species. We're capable of learning and improving and growing. And uh, I think we're better off, you know, as a result of these traumas than we were before. Um, I, I do. Thank you so much, John. It's been a pleasure and an honor. You truly illustrated McLuhan's great line, communication of the new is a miracle, but it's not impossible. <laughs> we, we truly learned a lot of new stuff today. Thank you, John. Thank, thank you. you. Yeah, thank you both for having me. It's been a blast. One of the best interviews I've ever had. So much fun. Uh, you guys made me laugh a lot. Thank you. I appreciate that. <laughs>